name is Yash Kuk Mo. His spirit haunts this valley, deep in the rainforest of Honduras. He is the legendary founder of Copan, a Maya city mysteriously abandoned over 1,000 years ago. For 400 years, his dynasty of holy lords rules a kingdom through hallucinogenic visions, ritual warfare, and human sacrifice. If the legend of Yashkuk Mo is true, then scientists believe he must be buried here, beneath this massive temple pyramid. One hundred thirty feet down and sixteen hundred years back in time, anthropologist Robert Scherer burrows deep into the pyramid, searching for the bones of Yashkuk Mo. After ten years of excavating and tunneling, following lines left from plaster floors long ago buried, Scherer uncovers an immense underground temple. On a vibrantly colored stucco panel, carved with symbols only recently decoded, is the name of the legendary first king of Copan, Yash Kuk Mo. When we found this stuccoed panel in our tunneling in the Acropolis, we knew we had found the first uh, explicit evidence that this area was associated with Yash Kukmo, the founder of the Copan dynasty. We wanted to get to even deeper levels to be able to find things, buildings, whatever, that were directly associated with Yash Kukmo, such as his tomb. Scherer descends into the humid darkness, traveling back in archaeological time. In the depths of this sacred monument, a modern scientist rediscovers a 1,600-year-old tomb. There's the slab. Inside, Shara finds a disintegrating jade-studded skeleton. Are these the bones of Yash Kuk Mo? Do you remember out of the, other the search for Yash Kuk Mo is revealing the entire lost history of Copan and challenging archaeologists with new riddles. How did this dynasty come to power? What finally brought about its doom? and the demise of one of the greatest civilizations of ancient times, the Maya. November 17th, 1839. In the jungles of Honduras, a small expedition is about to make a momentous discovery. Two young explorers, American John Lloyd Stevens and Englishman Frederick Catherwood, stumble upon a vine-strangled ruin. They are entering the ancient Maya city of Copan. Catherwood, an excellent draftsman, brings the exotic world of Copan back to life through his drawings of temples and monuments. Their best-selling book, Incidents of Travel in Central America, 
captivates the public with stories of a lost civilization newly found. Stevens and Cather would explore a world that stretches from the highlands of Chiapas in Mexico to the lowlands of the Yucatan Peninsula and into the tropical rainforests of Central America. They discover 44 Maya cities, remains of a culture that flourished for more than 700 years, from roughly 200 to 900 of the Common Era. But beyond their sheer beauty and size, the towering temple pyramids conceal something even more amazing. Many are astronomically aligned to the Sun and Venus. And the strange markings that cover the buildings are more than decorative. They are evidence of Maya picture writing, the most comprehensive ancient script of the Americas and one of only five original writing systems in the world. Who are these Maya? How did they build these magnificent cities rising out of the jungle? The answers lie in the place that best exemplifies Maya art, architecture and culture. Copan, the Athens of Central America. Throughout Copan's nearly 10 square miles, about half the size of Manhattan, beautifully carved monuments and temple pyramids rise from the jungle. At the center of the ruined city, Catherwood and Stevens find a key piece of the puzzle that will eventually explain the rise and fall of the great Maya civilization. The Acropolis, a massive stone complex of temples and pyramids. Close to its center is a four-foot square monument that archaeologists call Alter Q. Carved on its sides are 16 enigmatic figures. What secrets are locked away in these cryptic carvings? As he looks out over Copan, John Lloyd Stevens ponders the mysteries of the Maya. One thing I believe, he writes, the history of Copan is graven on its monuments. Who shall read them? 150 years later, Stevens finally got an answer to his question. David Stewart. Stewart, the son of Maya experts, took his first trip to Central America when he was three years old. He began deciphering glyphs at age eight and by the time he was 18, he became the youngest person ever awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant. Today, David Stewart is working at Copan with Barbara Fash, director of the Hieroglyphic Stairway Project. Each of the stairway's 2,200 blocks displays a carved glyph. Unfortunately, Many of the glyphs are wearing away. So it's just crumbling away. Right. When John Lloyd Stevens came here about 160 years ago, he speculated that the history was written in stone, that the inscriptions contained historical records. And it turns out he was absolutely right. He had good instincts. Uh, behind me here is the great hieroglyphic stairway of Copan, which is one of the longest texts in the world, certainly the longest text from pre-Columbian America. And written in it are the dates and names of the royal history of Copan. And we've really only been able to read the details of this in the last, oh, 15, 20 years. To resurrect the voice of the Maya, 
scholars must overcome one of the most tragic losses in history, that of the Maya Code. For centuries, the Maya created thousands of books made of bark and covered with hieroglyphs. But in the 1500s, when the Spanish conquered Central America, the Spanish priests declare the strange books to be the work of the devil and burn them. A thousand years of knowledge and the key to understanding the Maya writing go up in smoke. Fortunately, the Maya wrote on other surfaces that couldn't be burned. And miraculously, four of the Maya books, or codices, escaped the Spanish bonfires. One of those books leads to the first major breakthrough in deciphering Maya writing and understanding the Maya's reverence for time. One of the first things that was deciphered about 100 years ago was the calendar system. And uh, I have an example of it here from an ancient Maya book, a facsimile of one, uh, where we have an example of a date written with five numbers using bars and dots. That's the way the Maya represented numbers between 1 and 19. A bar was a 5, and a single dot was a 1. So if we look at this column, for example, right here, we have uh, five numbers, the top one being an 8. The next one down is an 11. Then after that, an 8 and a 7, and then this football-shaped sign is the way the ancient Maya wrote a 0 sometimes. Their knowledge of the number system helped early scholars discover that the Maya books were celestial almanacs. The Maya could chart the 365-day solar cycle, predict solar and lunar eclipses, and even track the complex orbit of Venus. Amazingly, their Venus almanac is accurate to within two hours every 500 years. This incredible astronomical ability and the apparent lack of any fortifications around Maya cities led early scholars to see the Maya as not only the most advanced civilization in the Americas, but also a peaceful people. When these scholars looked at Alter Q, they believed they were seeing a conference of peaceful astronomer priests. But a shocking discovery in 1946 would forever change the image of the peaceful Maya. Bonampak, a ruined Maya palace in the jungles of southern Mexico, unveiled a series of startling murals depicting torture, warfare, and bloodshed. Yet it took another 40 years for scholars to accept that the Maya, for all their heavenly concerns, practiced the earthly tradition of warfare, torture, and human sacrifice. And at sites like the Venus Temple at Copan, modern archaeoastronomers began to detect the true purpose of Maya sky watching. Here, Maya astronomer priests track the complex journey of Venus through the sky with astounding accuracy. Why the need for this Maya precision in watching the sky, a precision unattainable in Europe until the time of Galileo, a thousand years after the Maya? Well, the objects that move around in the sky were the ancestors of the Maya. They were the gods of the Maya, and the Maya needed to follow them with great accuracy to know what to do here on Earth. I suppose we could say the planets became the, uh, the reason that their authority was legitimized. And one object in particular, Venus, became their patron god of war. They wrote about it in their codices. They inscribed it in their Stele of Copan. They used it to time their rituals, their sacrifices, the precise times when they would conduct war. To the Maya, Venus was not the planet of love, but the god of ritual warfare 
and bloody sacrifice. But if the figures on Altar Q are not peaceful astronomer priests, who are they? In the early days of my archaeology, uh, really before the glyphs could be deciphered, it was thought that the inscriptions contained a lot of information about uh, the calendar, about the planets, astronomy, a lot of kind of esoteric information for the priests to read and contemplate. And uh, about 1960 or so, things really changed. There was a woman working at the Peabody Museum at Harvard named Tatyana Proskriakov, and she noticed that uh, she could divide up the inscriptions into segments of time that corresponded more or less to a human lifetime. And using those texts, she identified a glyph that she thought was a glyph for birth, another glyph for death, and then for a very important event that occurred in between these two dates that was, she surmised, the inauguration of someone to kingship. Turned out she was absolutely right. Are these the kings responsible for Copan's magnificent temples and bloody rituals? After 150 years of slow progress, the pace of decipherment suddenly explodes. In the 1970s, scholars could only identify perhaps 10% of the glyphs. 30 years later, they can read 80% of Maya writing. And by studying the language the Maya people use today, Stuart and other scholars learned the sounds and meanings of the ancient Maya glyphs. Now, when David Stewart looks at Alter Q, he's reading the history of real people. When we were able to actually decipher Maya hieroglyphs, these anonymous characters were suddenly transformed into real people. We now know that they're kings and that on the altar, they're all sitting on their name glyphs. When we can read those names, we can actually read the names of ancient Maya kings. The 16th king's name is Yashpasa Chanyopat. The sky is newly revealed. The 15th king's name is Kak Yipiyah Chan Kawil. Fire is the strength of the sky god Kawil. The 13th king's name is Washaklahun Ubak Awil. Eighteen are the images of the god, nicknamed Eighteen Rabbit. The eleventh king's name is Kak Utichan. Fire is the mouth of the snake. The seventh king's name is Balam Nen. The Jaguar Mirror. All the figures sit on name glyphs, with one prominent exception. The first figure, the one who anoints the 16th king with the baton of office, sits on the glyph that represents the Maya word, Lord. Years after the other kings were identified, the first figure on Alter Q remained a mystery. Dressed differently from the others and wearing the eye goggles of the Central American rain god, Many Maya scholars believe this figure must surely be a god. Then David Stewart found his name hidden in plain sight. Ever since we realized this was a king list of Copan, the first figure in the list was always mysterious. We always wondered, where's his name? Who is this guy? And I was here back in 1986 and realized that he's not actually sitting on his name glyph, but rather has his name up in his headdress. And if you look closely, you'll see that he's got a Quetzal feather device back here. He has a macaw head on the bird. He has a sun symbol and the symbol Yash for green or blue. And I realized there that there are all four elements of the name, Keen for sun, Yash, and Kuk Quetzal Mo Maka, Kinich Yashkuk Mo. That was the name of the founder. 
After 150 years of trying to crack the Maya code, the most prominent figure on Alter Q now has a name. Kinich Yashkukmo. Great Sun Green Quetzal Macaw. Now archaeologists want to find the crucial piece of evidence to confirm his existence, his bones. But where should they dig? Archaeologist Bill Fash has been exploring the secrets of Copan since he first visited as a teenager. Today, he is director of the Acropolis Project. Like Catherwood and Stevens, Fash believes the key to understanding Copan lies at the heart of its sacred geography, in the Acropolis. At the height of Copan's glory, the Acropolis was crowned by magnificent temples and served as the spiritual and political center for Copan's rulers. The Copan River has been diverted from its natural course, but centuries ago, the river cut through part of this gigantic stone platform. The erosion left a unique cutaway view of the Acropolis and offers a window into the history of Copan. Over the course of the last thousand years, slowly but surely, the Acropolis has been getting eaten away by the river. Now, the upside of all of this is that it's exposed 400 years of construction in the resulting Acropolis cut. So we have the opportunity to look at the works of all 16 kings of Copan it is, in effect, uh, like Alter Q, only in architecture rather than in a single stone sculpture. Each of Copan's 16 kings built his own temples on top of the previous kings, a tradition which, over many generations, formed the monuments of the Acropolis. If Yashkukmo is indeed the founder of the Copan dynasty, then his tomb and temples should be at the lowest level of the Acropolis. But his bones could be buried anywhere in the half square mile of this vast stone ruin, an area the size of 14 city blocks. Bill Fash looks to Alter Q to point him in the right direction. On Alter Q, we have a handsome portrait of Kinichi Yashkukmo, the founder, and a textual reference to this being the stone of Yashkukmo. The implication is this is his place and his monument. It happens to be placed in front of one of the most massive temple pyramids on the site. The implication is that this is the funerary temple of Kinichi Yashkukmo, the founder of the Kopan dynasty. But to find out if that's true, we have to dig. After working their way down through the layers, archaeologists finally reached the depth that should correspond to the origins of the mighty Copan dynasty. Here, at the very foundation of the Acropolis, Bill Fash's colleague Robert Scherer hopes to uncover the truth about Copan's legendary founder, Yashkuk Mo. the slab. Before his eyes is a disintegrating skeleton decorated with jade and jewels. Are these the remains of Yashkukmo? The um, offerings here are shell ear flares, each with a jade bead. There are also a series of tubular shell beads. These were adornments that um, he once wore. 
This particular jade bead is carved with the woven mat motif, which to the Maya represented rulership. And this person's teeth are filed and inlaid with jade, also a symbol of Maya aristocracy. We have a early classic cylinder tripod, and it looks like it has some residue still inside. Wow, look at that. As Scherer and his associate, Ellen Bell, remove the precious contents of the tomb, they still face the question, are these the remains of Yash Kukmo? Once again, Scherer turns to a familiar source, or to Q. The image of Yash Kukmo on the side of Walter Q is one of the most detailed in all of Copan, right down to his jewelry. It depicts him wearing ear flares in a single jade bar, jewelry identical to ones found by Shearer in the tomb. The image of Yash Kukmo on Walter Q also depicts him holding a shield on his right arm, making him a left-handed warrior. That corresponds intriguingly to evidence from the bones. The bones in the tomb tell us many things about the man buried here. They tell us his age. He was an elderly individual, probably over 50 years old at death. They tell us, um, of course, that he was male. They also tell us about a series of injuries, combat-style injuries that he suffered during life. Perhaps most dramatic, a uh, severe blow to the right forearm uh, of the type that's usually called a peri fracture, the kind of fracture that one gets in uh, warding off a blow with the forearm in this case, probably with a shield on that forearm. This also gives us added information about the individual's identity because on altar Q, that individual is depicted wearing a shield on his right arm. This is one more case where the myth of Copan's dynastic founder is becoming real through archaeological evidence. But the skeleton holds more clues. Studies of the minerals found in the teeth and bones indicate that this individual is not from Copan. In Maya legend and hieroglyphic text, Yash Kukmo is referred to as Lord of the West. But if he is not native to Copan, where is he from? The inscription on the top of Altar Q really tells the story about Yash Kukmo and how he came to Copan. It begins with a reference to a day in the early 400s when it says that he took the emblems of office at a place that we think is connected somehow to Teotihuacan or with central Mexico somewhere. Three days later, it says, he comes from that place. He leaves that very spot. And then the inscription goes on to say something really remarkable. 153 days after he leaves, apparently, central Mexico, he rests his legs. And then it says he is a West Lord, and that's a title that he has throughout the Copan inscriptions, throughout history. And then finally, the last two glyphs of the passage read, Huli Ushwitik, he arrived at Copan. So there's no question in my mind that Kinich Yashkukmo became a king at a very faraway spot in central Mexico and brought those emblems of office back here to Copan to found the dynasty. Based on the evidence, the location of the tomb in the Acropolis, matching the jewelry and fractured bones from the tomb with the image of Yashkukmo on Alta Q, and the origin of the bones confirming the text on Alta Q. Archaeologists are now sure Yash Kukmo was a real king and that they have discovered his tomb. 
but these findings pose new mysteries. What did Yashkuk Mo find when he arrived? How did this outsider conquer Copan and create a 400-year dynasty? To answer those questions, Honduran archaeologist Ricardo Agurcia starts at the source, the Copan River. From the earliest of times, the history of Copan is tied to this river. Not only did it provide water for drinking, for washing, and for bathing, it also provided the rich alluvial soils, which were essential for the agricultural systems of the ancient Maya. The river was also a valuable trade route for cotton, exotic bird feathers, obsidian, and jade. The rulers of early Copan grew prosperous and began to build. And by the year 400, the time of Yash Kuk Mo's arrival, Copan is dominated by feuding warlords. Into this arena steps Kinich Yash Kuk Mo, who brings with him the might and the power to consolidate the political power and create a new kingdom, which flourishes for the next 400 years. Yash Kuk Mo's arrival is probably marked by terror and bloodshed. He may have consolidated his power through a strategic alliance, marrying into the family of a local warlord. But how did he ensure the lasting success of his dynasty, one that endures for the next 15 generations? Evidence of his strategy is hidden in the forest on the edge of Copan's great plaza. By 160 AD, in the Copan Valley, there are all different kinds of evidence that indicate that things were getting pretty interesting. And there are a number of archaeological finds that indicate a large population with extensive trade connections building some fairly monumental structures. Fash suspects that one of those structures lies beneath this tree-covered mound. His field study students Survey the area. Okay, John, come back this way. Ready. As soon as workers start to excavate, they uncover cut stone building blocks. These blocks are the remains of an earlier Acropolis, a ritual center that predates the arrival of Yash Kuk Mo. The structure that would replace it seems to have been carefully designed by Yash Kuk Mo to solidify his rule. After the arrival of Yash Kuk Mo in AD 426, he decides to make a clean break with the past and the old dynasty. The old Acropolis and Center for Performances is abandoned, and instead he creates his own regal ritual center about 200 yards south of the old Acropolis. And for this magnificent historic occasion, he dedicates a whole series of new monuments in his new center, including a new ball court, new palaces, new temples, and essentially puts a new stamp and a new seal on the kingdom of Copan, saying this is a new place now, this is a new dynasty, and we're going to start afresh with a new vision and a new regal ritual center. Yash Kuk Mo builds bigger than any Maya lord before him. For the first time in Copan, the temples and monuments are inscribed with Maya writing. In these inscriptions, the legend of Yash Kuk Mo is born. But also hidden on the carved stones of Copan is evidence of Yash Kuk Mo's most powerful weapon, the perfect timing of his arrival. The year 426 corresponds to a powerful milestone in the Maya calendar, the Bakhtun. The Maya Bakhtun is a recurring 400-year period. 
Like our own millennium, its onset was both an auspicious and fearful occasion. Yash Kukmo's arrival ushers in the ninth Baktun and elevates him to the realm of the supernatural. Stila 63 is probably the earliest dated stila we have from Copan, and it commemorates an extremely important time period in the Maya calendar. It has a date on the front of it that reads 90000. In other words, it was the beginning of the ninth Baktun. This was a period that would only occur every 400 years or so, and the scribes and kings of Copan decided to commemorate that time period using this stila and associating it with Kinich Yashkukmo, the first king of the dynasty. And it can't be a coincidence that the beginning of the Baktun was also the beginning of history at Copan. Yashkukmo, Lord of the West, the outsider, accomplishes what had never been done before. He consolidates power into a single dynasty and sparks a period of unprecedented growth and artistic achievement. Copan's holy lords, the successors of Yashkukmo, rule for the next 400 years an entire Maya Baktun. But with the death of Yashkukmo around the year 450, how does his son and the next 15 generations maintain the power of the great founder? What new weapon could they add to their arsenal of monument building, warfare, calendar worship, and blood rituals? Found buried beneath the hieroglyphic stairway, this monument holds the answer. Inscriptions on this altar called the Mat Mat Marker reveal that it was dedicated by the second ruler of Copan. The new weapon he brings to the dynasty is the image of his father, Yash Kukmo. The simple marker stone is actually the earliest monument we have from Copan. It shows the king, Kinich Yashkukmo, on one side, along with his son, Ruler Two, on the other side. The presentation of the scene here anticipates other monuments at Copan that come much later, such as Altar Q, where we have the 16th ruler receiving the staff of office from Kinich Yashkukmo. Here, Ruler Two does much the same thing, relying on the founder, his father in this case, as the ultimate symbol of his power. This iconographic connection to Yash Kukmo becomes the visual propaganda technique employed by each of the 14 kings that follow. From the Mat Mat marker, to the hieroglyphic stairway, to Alta Q, the kings of Copan legitimize their power by linking themselves to the dynastic founder, Yash Kukmo. but they also invoke his power more directly. The holiest site in Copan's sacred geography is the place where Yash Kukmo is buried. It lies at the heart of the Acropolis. Behind Altar Q, deep within this temple pyramid, Ricardo Agurcia discovers the best preserved Maya temple ever found. He names it Rosalila. Rosalila sits in the middle of a long sequence of constructions built over 400 years by the ancient Maya. It is built in the year 571 AD by Moon Jaguar, the 10th ruler of Copan. And like all the other buildings in the central axis of the Copan Acropolis, it is dedicated to the memory of the founder of the dynasty, Kinich Yashkukmo. But unlike all the other buildings in this long sequence of constructions, 
Rosa Lila is the only one that's completely and entirely preserved. It is, in fact, embalmed by the ancient Maya and reflects the art and architecture as well as the religious thought of the ancient Maya like no other building does. For nearly a century, the Maya kings maintained Rosa Lila, retouching its ornate sculpture with fresh plaster and paint. The original grandeur and beauty of Rosalila is restored in this full-scale model in the Copan Museum. A subsequent Maya king carefully buried Rosalila intact within a newer temple pyramid, the ultimate expression of his reverence. But while Rosalila was still in use, the kings of Copan would worship there, conjuring the wisdom and power of Yashkukmo. As the living king would walk into the Rosalila temple, he would be entering the realm of the supernatural. This was a sacred cave, a passageway to the underworld and the world of the dead. And it was through ritual acts that the king would be able to communicate then with his dead ancestors. Normally this required bloodletting. It required the king to pierce himself with a stingray spine, either in the genitals, the tongue, or in his ears. This sacred blood was then placed on paper or on cloth, and then was put inside of an incense burner. From this would spew smoke, and it was in the smoke that the king would have his vision, that his ancestor would come forth and share his wisdom and knowledge with him. In Rosalila, we have found the archaeological evidence for these rituals. We have found the incense burners, the stingray spines, jade, flowers, and the incense itself, proving, therefore, that this was a doorway to those ancient ancestors for the living kings of Copan. But how long could the legacy of Yashkuk Mo sustain a dynasty? By the time of 18 Rabbit, the 13th ruler of Copan, the city reaches the height of its power. Copan has vassal cities in Quirigua, Los Igos, and Rio Amarillo. 18 Rabbit extends Copan's sacred geography far beyond the Acropolis and the Great Plaza, erecting monuments deep into the valley. Along the great plaza of Copan, Ruler 13 dedicates rows of these stelae, or as the Maya called them, big stones. Each one marks the sacred passage of time and describes the ritual the king performs at that time. Just at the edge of the great plaza is the site of the most sacred of these rituals, the ball game. The game was played on two levels, within the mythological Maya underworld and here on Copan's ball court. It was a game that often ended in the ritual beheading of the defeated team. The loser's skull sometimes replaced the ball. The Maya ball game lay at the heart of religious ritual. And when the Copan king took the court against his enemy, they were playing for stakes of life and death. But in this, the one who controlled the ball was the one who was also controlling the sun, for the ball was like the sun, moving in and out of the underworld. And when finally the winner could be determined and the victim was slain, it was his blood, the defeated one's blood, that would seal the deal and keep the sun in perpetual motion. For over 400 years, this elaborate system of ceremony and sacrifice secured power 
for the kings and ruling elite of Copan and other Maya cities. So what happened to this potent dynasty? Ironically, its very success led to its downfall. The story of Copan's decline is written between the lines of the 2200 glyphs carved into the massive stone blocks that form the 90-foot tall hieroglyphic stairway. The 61st and final step of the stairway is dedicated to 18 Rabbit. He rules for 42 prosperous years. To celebrate completion of Copan's great ball court, one spring day in the year 738, he goes looking for sacrificial victims to play ball. Unfortunately for 18 Rabbit, the tables turn, and the king of Kirigua, one of Copan's vassal cities, captures 18 Rabbit and beheads him. The hieroglyphic stairway, the monument meant to celebrate the divine power of Yashkuk Mo's dynasty, suddenly takes on a new purpose. The text of the hieroglyphic stairway is a history of the dynasty, starting with Yashkuk Mo. But also, interestingly, is a phrase about the decapitation and a demise of 18 Rabbit, the 13th ruler, at the hands of Kirigua. And so at that point, then, the stairway seems to become somewhat of a propaganda tool for the dynasty to reestablish its power after that defeat. Smokeshell, the 14th king of Yashkuk Mo's dynasty, builds the colossal hieroglyphic stairway to demonstrate his authority and assure his people all is well. But as soon as archaeologists start excavating the stairway in the 1890s, they find its shoddy construction contradicts the propaganda. The archaeological investigation of the stairway has shown that the mortar the ancient Maya used to put it together uh, originally was some of the weakest at the site. And so the irony of the stairway is that here we have this grandiose statement to the power and glory of the Copan dynasty, but it's one of the first buildings to probably collapse. Over the next 100 years, the power of the dynasty continues to decline. In a last desperate attempt, Yash Pasa, the 16th and final king of Copan, tries to resurrect Copan's former glory by commissioning the carving of Altar Q. Altar Q is the ultimate symbol of the continuity of Yash Kukmo's regime, invoking his power through building, blood, and sacrifice. But even the Maya gods seem to be saying that it is time for the dynasty to end. Altar Q, with its 16 portraits of the rulers of Copan, is much more than just a visual king list. All of the kings are shown in a remarkable symmetry that reflects cosmology and its combination with history in the Maya sense of the world. There are four kings on each four sides, and I think the lord who dedicated this stone certainly was aware of the fact that he could construct a monument that would show all of his ancestors in such a remarkable uh, pattern of symmetry that reflected the